Sakai. Yuzo. You look like a scarecrow. You've looked better too. <laughs> Can I have my hat? When Ryuzo first appeared on the scene of Ghost of Tsushima, I was immediately drawn to one trait in particular, his insistence to stand his ground. I'm of course speaking figuratively. He survived Komodo Beach by not standing his ground, but what really distinguished him for me from the other side characters was that he would do everything in his power to assert himself, no matter the situation. He makes a cunning foil for Jin Sakai. Cynical, hardened, pragmatic, realistic. So as the story progressed, it became clear that while Jin and Ryuzo appreciated each other, something had gone terribly rotten between them. I want to explore the relationship of Jin and Ryuzo, piecing together what we know to figure out what really went wrong. How two childhood friends would ultimately challenge each other in a fight to the death. The story of Ryuzo is sprinkled all throughout the game. Most of it is found in dialogue with other characters, or Jin's personal moments of reflection. It appears that Ryuzo was a local of Omi Village, and met Jin in that way. An unlikely friendship made possible because of their proximity. And like how many childhood friendships begin, there was no discrimination between them. A samurai son and a peasant found common ground as long as they enjoyed spending time together. They had their share of pranks, mischief, even dreams of exploring the world together. We're not certain who always came up with their next adventure, but judging from their personalities in the game, it seems Ryuzo was the more ambitious one, while Jin was the one enchanted by his friend's wild side. It seems like a typical tale of a shy, sensitive boy meeting the cool kid on the block who gets peer pressured into doing more than a few ill-advised things, but can't help being drawn to them. Considering Jin lost his mother at a very young age, and Lord Kazumasa Sakai became very withdrawn, no doubt Jin resorted to Ryuzo's companionship more often than not. Ryuzo might even have been one of his only friends, as it is apparent that Jin did experience some bullying as a boy. In those formative years, as they were growing up into young men, they trained together to become warriors, and might have even dreamed of fighting side by side for their home. Now when they have that very chance, isn't it something that they would avidly pursue? When Jin encounters Ryuzo for the first time, Ryuzo is more than a bit down on his luck. He's a mercenary now, fighting among the straw hat ronin, but when everything went wrong at Komoda Beach, and their leader died, he took it upon himself to become the leader. However, it's been more than a handful taking care of these warriors. The land has been stripped of food, and so most of his men are starving and sick, and can't even fight back against the Mongols if they could. Ryuzo feels the heavy burden of responsibility, but cherishes it at the same time. It gives him a sense of purpose, of importance. Thus, Jin begins to negotiate help rescue Lord Shimura and retake Tsushima, and he can name his price. Jin even offers Ryuzo the chance to be a real samurai, the lord of his own clan. After all, he is a little perplexed that Ryuzo ended up being a mere mercenary after all this time. Throughout their journey in search of food for the Straw Hats, tensions rise to the surface, and a clear contrast is made between them. Jin is full of hope and confidence, enough to take charge if he wanted to, while Ryuzo is full of cynicism and insecurity. In an effort to assert himself, more than once he calls out Jin for trying to do his job, as if that mattered more than settling the problems at hand. Ryuzo is showing all the traits of a shaky leader. He goes out hunting for his men rather than letting them hunt for themselves. He lacks ingenuity when he insists that Jin plan their attacks rather than taking charge himself, and it's as if he's more concerned about failing and having to take responsibility than trying anything at all. In response to all this behavior, Jin is once again confused. Is this the Ryuzo he used to know? Unfortunately for Jin, his hopeful idealism isn't rewarded like it normally is. He doesn't deliver for Ryuzo, 
and instead the Mongols are ironically able to provide what he cannot. Despite seeming victories, they still end up losers. Now that Jin has lost tangible commodity to negotiate with, it all comes down to an intangible exchange of integrity. Even if we have nothing now, hold fast and count on things getting better in the future. It's what having honor is all about. When the going gets tough, this is what your code was for all along, why you followed it in the first place. Jin believes that Rizo operates in the same manner as himself, and so he puts full faith in his friend to come through. However, it's foreshadowed long before that Rizo has changed. Jin uncovers what happened at a tournament they participated in a few years before. It was Ruzo's one chance to make something of himself, and yet Jin destroyed it for him when they dueled. Ruzo was expecting graciousness, when instead he was thrown down like a mortal enemy. Perhaps it was Ruzo who felt that he was the one betrayed first, and so didn't seek to be hired by Jin afterwards. The humiliation of having to be hired by the person who beat you because no one else would hire you, that was too much for him. Ruzo doesn't hide the fact that he did at that time want to be a samurai, but this blow to his aspiration completely disenchanted him. Perhaps it would have been better if he never wanted to be a samurai in the first place. The forces driving Ruzo's behavior at this point are made the most clear with his cynical confrontation at Castle Canada. He'd rather be a traitor and even kill his friend than be a samurai. This is a staggering realization to Jin, that someone would not want to be a samurai. For Ruza, the Khan was an opportunity not simply to save what he cared about, himself and his men, but to make something of himself outside of being a samurai, the ultimate act of arrogant ambition. We of course know how this all turned out for Ruza. He becomes the fool. The Khan does as he promised but cares nothing for Ryuzo. He escaped one potential slavery to become a pawn for another. Letting his fears get the better of him was the worst decision he could ever make. And now he is alone, hated by the people of Tsushima. The ironic role of Ryuzo in this story only gets worse when he tells the Khan to use Jin's friends to try to get him to capitulate, rather than kill Jin outright. This cruel proposal ironically saves Jin, who is instead forced to reconcile it with the horror of Taka's sacrifice. Ruzo has no idea what storm he has stirred up inside Jin. Taka was more of a friend than Ruzo ever was. He sees that clearly now. And for that, Ruzo has to pay. By this time, Ruzo has already made up his mind that he wants to switch sides once again but the Khan already anticipated this. He discards Ruzo at Castle Shimura now that he has no more use for him, hoping it will cause more strife for Jin. In a harrowing final confrontation, Ruzo appeals to Jin's influence to save him, to lie and make up a story to conceal what really happened. This is the ultimate spit in the face, because Ruzo knows that Jin would desperately want to do this. But it's a horrible thought to use his influence as the ghost to do something so selfish after all the harm Ruzo caused. It spits in the face of what the ghost was meant to stand for, for true honor and fighting for what is right. Is that all the ghost was? A way to control people to get what he wants? Is that all Ruzo thought it was about too? It's such an offensive proposition that Jin silences Ruzo immediately and demands him to surrender for his crimes. But Ryuzo has so much resentment that he refuses and forces Jin to kill him instead, preferring this than to die by Lord Shimura's hand. It's a bitter end, and I believe Jin truly acted out of hate and anger, despite it being honorable combat. As Ryuzo's body slumps to the floor, Jin is left with a terrible realization. Maybe he never really deserved friends. Think about it from Jin's perspective. A best friend from childhood tells you to your face that he hates everything you belong to, that what you used to have was a lifetime ago, and now none of it matters. Furthermore, while Jin looked at Ryuzo as an equal, 
Ryuzo put Jin and all the samurai in the place of oppressor, and Jin saw none of this coming because he elevated the samurai code to such a high pedestal. And by the time Jin sees the hypocrisy of the samurai for himself, he can't help understand why Ryuzo left it all. Ryuzo saw it all first for what it really was, and Jin was clueless to this. Jin failed Ryuzo, just as he failed Taka, and anyone else who he dared call a friend. All this dawning on him at such a quick moment of time, if Jin was such a bad friend and a poor judge of character to ever have someone like Ryuzo at his side, maybe he really isn't worth anyone's friendship. Ryuzo was a fool and insecure, albeit there was something bitterly true about what he stood for and what he was even willing to die for. To be a samurai is to be a slave, and that's no preferable to being ruled by the Mongols. Going back to Jin and Ryuzo's childhood, an ominous piece of lore is uncovered near the end of the story in a flashback. When Kazumasa died, this caused an enormous shift in the relationship between Ryuzo and Jin. Jin wasn't just a samurai's son in a quaint village. He was now the Jito's ward, living in a castle. This was a huge shift in public perception of Jin, of his social class and standing. But Ryuzo was left where he was, a lowly ronin. When before it was easy enough to pretend to be equals, they couldn't do it anymore. Jin's tragedy was a stroke of luck in Ryuzo's eyes. This is where their friendship truly started rotting. It wasn't just cynicism that festered in Ryuzo's heart about Jin. It was envy. Envy was the root of all his pride, his fear and insecurity. It consumed Ryuzo so much that he even told Jin to forget thinking it was all permanent, that Lord Chimura would cast him away once he had a son of his own. This incident alone was probably enough to drive a major wedge between them, as both would drift apart over the years, talking less and less, and ultimately going separate ways. In that fateful tournament, Ryuzo wanted to prove himself and to others that he was a great warrior. But what he got wrong was that instead of trying to be the best warrior he could be, his ambition was to become better than Jin. And if he couldn't beat Jin, then it wasn't worth trying to be anything at all. It wasn't just hurt aspirations in that duel, it was pride. Ryuzo put envy and pride above personal growth, and this was the greatest hindrance to his potential. He could have become a great samurai in the service of Clan Sakai, even become a brother in arms, and Jin honestly couldn't care less that Ryuzo was technically of lower rank. Despite his weaknesses and naivete, Jin was pure-hearted in his love for Ryuzo, and never actually looked down on him, even if Ryuzo insinuated this. This is what Ryuzo ultimately took for granted, being unwilling to give up his pride and envy, and just embrace Jin as a truly loving friend who only wanted to see him prosper. Neither of them were perfect, but to break apart was never worth what they threw away. The interactions of Jin and Ryuzo before their split was riddled with toxic behavior, be it the back talking or bitter jokes from either side. None of it was truly good natured, as if they really wanted to say something else on their minds, but never would. They always left their true thoughts unspoken. Think of all the things they could have talked through before it all fell apart. Even when Kazumasa had died years before, Ryuzo could have been honest with Jin about what it's like to be of low social standing and what it felt like always being in his shadow. Jin likewise needed not to be afraid of engaging with these tough conversations and be open about how much he wanted to make things right, but they never made such attempts. Instead, silence drifted them apart, closing off their true feelings, faking the friendship when it was no longer really there. Jin wanted to cling to the past, to the ideal he remembered. But for Ryuzo, that was probably some of his most painful memories. To remember a time when he didn't have to worry about other people's opinions. When they were truly free to be who they wanted. 
and now they could never be free. Choices were made that couldn't be undone, and it was a bond broken forever. If I'd gone easy on you, everyone would have known. You were trying to kill me. I couldn't let myself be defeated by... By a lonely Ronin? That's not what I meant. You were born, Lord Sakai. That tournament was my one chance to gain attention. To enter the service of a lord, become a samurai. You should have come to me. I would have hired you. Because no one else would? No. I needed to prove myself. I wish you told me this earlier. Maybe I should have. As famous writer Fyodor Dostoevsky once said, much unhappiness has come into the world because of bewilderment and things left unsaid. There is a harsh lesson to be learned in the tale of Yuzo, of the perils of pride and envy, and how even a once good friendship can end in tragedy. Even if people love to hate Ryuzo for the role he plays in this story, he was a really well-made and sympathetic character, and I hope more people will come to see this about him in time. Ryuzo is just one of the many story threads that make up the fabric of Ghost of Tsuchima. All the threads are unique, and yet seem to be saying the same thing. It's all about a study of the complexities of human relationship, of the meaning of good and evil, and what makes us who we are. So I hope you enjoyed this examination of Ryuzo and Jin, the ill-fated friendship that I think all of us hoped could have ended differently. <laughs>